So as you know, last week I covered Bentley's hack pack on the channel so that I could cover it separately from Sly Cooper Thieves in Time and really focus my thoughts on the game in this video. Thankfully for once, that plan went off without a hitch and I actually got this video made right on time. With Sucker Punch Productions having moved on to creating the infamous series, the fate of the Sly Cooper series was left up in the air for quite a long stretch of time. After Sly 3's release in late 2005, there wouldn't be a peep out of the series for five Five years, with the Sly Collection being announced and released in 2010 by Senzaru Games, itself being an HD collection of the trilogy released for the PlayStation 3. After a player completed all three games, they could access this teaser clip showing an entirely new area with a silhouetted Sly sneaking through some glass. Glass? What? Followed up by a Sly 4 logo with a question mark. Now, I came to this Sly series long after this, so I can only imagine how exciting it must have been to relive each of these three games and then see this teaser. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the best ways you can do it. So yes, Senzaru was trusted with the HD ports of the original trilogy and had also presented a playable prototype to PlayStation for a potential Sly 4. Liking what they saw, they gave them the go-ahead after the Sly Collection's success. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time was announced the following summer during E3 2011 and released after some delays on February 5th, 2013 here in the States. Quite a wait, but was it worth the 8 year gap between the 3rd and 4th entries? It's weird being an outsider to the Sly fandom while still adoring the games. When I first played the trilogy for this video series, I instantly fell in love with them and they immediately became some of my favorite PlayStation games. They're simple games to play, but very considered, bursting with charm and characters that still make me smile just from thinking about them. But the few times I've ever heard anything slip out about Thieves in Time, it's never been as positive. And I've certainly had videos pushed to my YouTube homepage calling it the worst Sly game by a wide margin, citing it as an offensive mess that ruined the series. I've seen some call it outright non-canon in their minds. Some have even taken it upon themselves to write a true Sly 4. So I started playing this game with some trepidation. Is it really that bad? Or have some of the most extreme takes just found their way to me? Did it awaken new feelings within me that I didn't anticipate? In today's episode of Learning to Love PlayStation, we'll find an answer to at least one of those questions. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time takes the time machine line from the ending of Sly 3 and runs with it. The game opens an indeterminate amount of time after 3's conclusion, with the characters all off doing their own thing. Sly is feigning amnesia of the past, as you do, to focus on his relationship with Carmelita, Murray was off racing, and Bentley and Penelope were in care of the Thievius Raccoonus book with it in safekeeping. However, one day Bentley noticed that the words on the pages of the book were vanishing, and coincidentally, Penelope herself had disappeared. Bentley calls the group back together at their old hideout, breaks this information, and reveals that he had fitted the time machine into Murray's van. They could use it to travel to any point in time, so long as they had an item that was created in that time period. Or at least existed during it? Look, I'm going to say right away here that time travel plots are just an excuse to have fun, and looking too deeply into how none of it holds up takes a lot of the potential fun away. Is it fun to comb over it and see how it falls apart? Sure, but outside of ridiculous nonsense, I'm not going to be too harsh on what's clearly a contrivance. Speaking of contrivance, the first destination Bentley had pinpointed for them to time travel to was during Feudal Japan, and it just so happens that an art exhibit had opened in Paris featuring a Japanese samurai's dagger. The three coordinate a heist for old time's sake, and just as Sly is about to make off with the dagger, Carmelita appears and puts together that Sly had been lying about his amnesia. So far, so good. There's potential for character fiction that could pay off later, something the Sly series is especially good at. Sly lets out a few quips as he slips away, makes it back to the van, and then the three successfully travel back to the year 1603 to find Ryoichi Cooper and try to stop whatever was causing the Cooper family history to dissipate. Once there, they find that the area has been taken over with hints of modern technology strewn about and a specifically out of place character, El Jefe, in charge of the show. Ryoichi Cooper, the inventor of sushi, is locked up behind bars as El Jefe hunts for his thieving cane. This sets the pattern that will repeat itself throughout the rest of the game. 
The gang coordinate to break out Ryuichi and then break into his sushi restaurant to retrieve his cane, catch fish for him to refresh his sushi skills for some reason, put Murray into a geisha outfit, and then work their way toward confronting El Jefe. After a pretty decent boss fight, El Jefe manages to get away with Ryoichi's cane, but a rat drops a sheriff's badge, which lets the gang travel to the Wild West in 1884 to meet up with Tennessee Kid Cooper, who was arrested and set to be hanged amid an appreciation festival for the invading toothpick, a wannabe loudmouth cowboy armadillo who was after Kid Cooper's cane. Did Senzaru play Dylan's role in Western? As a fun side note, in the first Sly game, the first two sets of pages you recover for the Thievius Raccoonus were Ryuichi's and Tennessee's entries, so I think it's really cool that this game put them here in the same order like this. Bentley concludes that the only way to break out Tennessee is from the inside, so Sly paints on some posters and steals a lollipop, which lands him in the highest security jail cell that they immediately break out of with no one really noticing right away. Once free, they find out that Carmelita is here for some reason and is being held captive by Toothpick, so Tennessee rescues her, but then Sly, Bentley, and Murray are arrested and Toothpick also manages to take their van to super supercharge his train. The three are broken out and formulate a plan to take it back, where Carmelita explains she was put here after uncovering Cyril La Paradox, a famous art collector, unloading a stolen art collection in the present day, and then it was concluded that he was behind all of this for unknown reasons. From here, another heist is planned out, involving taking back the van from Toothpick's train, all the while stealing back Tennessee's gold that Toothpick had stolen from him. I've kinda just been drolly recounting this formulaic plot, but I do have to say there is something always inherently fun about a train robbery in a Wild West setting. It's just inherently cool, and it allows for a neat callback to an earlier Sly game where Tennessee climbs under a train as it goes along. I'll touch more on the worlds and all later on, but I wanted to point out here that this is a neat part of the game. It concludes with a boss fight against Toothpick, who can randomly turn big for some reason, so that's pretty cool. Another pattern is established though, as the bad guys are able to make off with Tennessee's cane, and after finding out the van's brakes are shot, Bentley throws Murray's necklace into the time-traveling receptacle, which takes the gang back to the prehistoric age, scattering essential parts of the machine in their crash. The gang locate the missing parts while bumping into the very first Cooper, who is the first character in this game to not speak English, surprisingly, and gets dubbed Bob as a result of such. They do the they can speak articulately in the subtitles but no one can understand them bit just for the part where Sly asks his name, but then after that, everyone converses with him normally, despite his different language. Uh, it's so weird, but nothing this series hasn't already done, I guess. Bob reveals that a grizzly bear named Grizz had stolen his cane and locked him up. There's a minor subplot here about Carmelita disappearing due to being upset about Sly getting her involved with this mess and being trapped in the past, which I would have mentioned, but I kind of forgot it, but it's okay because she comes back with the schematics of Grizz's operations somehow. There's also this strange training segment where Murray brings Bob up to speed by putting him through exercises against knockoff Rocky music, and a subplot where Murray gets sad because he can't climb ice walls like Bob can, therefore making him a bit useless. But then after ice skating against Grizz and defeating him, feels okay again and it isn't touched on again, it feels like they were just setting up something here and then just kind of went, eh, let's just put things back to normal an hour later. Also, Murray talks about food constantly now. I don't remember the older games word for word, but I swear it wasn't this prevalent before. It feels like a step back for him as a character. He was always the sort of dim but good-hearted character, but now he's just always hungry. This is just a really weird chapter of this game entirely, honestly. Grizz's actor's performance is great, so I liked him at the end of the day, but he walks around rapping to himself but wants to be a painter and is evil, I guess? I mostly just felt bad for him as he gets berated over the phone by Surreal for losing cell phone reception all the time. You know, the time-spanning cell phone calls. The world here just isn't fun to explore either, but again, we'll talk later about it. From here, the gang contacts Dimitri in the present, who I haven't mentioned until now because I forgot about him, but yeah, Dimitri from the Order Games is hanging out in the present and letting everyone know which Cooper they need to visit next. I don't think he speaks a word in this entire game, despite having voice dialogue and trailers, so I hope you can't blame me for forgetting about him. Grizz's crown was used to travel to medieval England in 1301. Once here, they find Sir Galeth Cooper is being held 
world as a jester at a circus and, get this, also had his cane stolen. He also tells our protagonist about the mysterious Black Knight who had recently taken over the area. It's also at this time that the game decides to remind you that Penelope exists and is still missing. Hmm, weird. After doing some recon on the Black Knight, Bentley discovers for himself that the Black Knight is actually Penelope in disguise, working for Surreal. Shock! Naturally, this breaks his turtle heart, as they were an item before this, and he retreats into his shell, leaving the rest of the gang to take her down on their own. So look, this is one of the points of contention for Sly fans. A lot of them really hate this, and I can't blame any of them, whether it be because it doesn't make much sense for her as a character, based on her worst sin before this, being obsessed with winning a trophy in Sly 3, or whether it be to just want Bentley to catch a break after being disabled in this series already, I really get it. For me, I'm mostly bothered because no element of this really comes together. Sort of like how the prior chapter introduces character drama for Murray and then resolves it immediately, Bentley is crushed by this, and then comes back to beat up Penelope in a mech fight, as you do, and the game tells you he has a newfound confidence, but after this event passes by, he's immediately exactly the same as he was before. How the prior games treated Bentley from starting out as a shy, easily scared dude, and turning him into an absolute shad lord by the end is one of the series' best elements, and introducing this huge shift for his personal life for it to not really affect him is disappointing by comparison. Penelope's motivations don't make a ton of sense either. She's upset that Bentley is being held back by working for the Cooper gang, and that together they could accomplish so much scientific good together, or whatever, but it isn't really established that she ever talked to him about this. She just kind of assumed that he just wouldn't go with anything. So she takes Bentley's time travel plans to Surreal, for some reason, and then makes a better time travel machine that doesn't require an object from the era to visit, even though Surreal likely has objects from those eras anyway, as an art thief. Um, I guess the basic way to put it is Bentley got cucked and felt okay about it, I don't know. The gang truck on along to an Arabian city in the year 1001 to find Salim al Kupar, which is a great name by the way, and his band of 40 thieves. But it turns out that they've all just about retired and find out that three of those thieves have been brainwashed by Miss Decibel, this area's invading boss character. I'd be lying if I said much of plot interest happens here despite it being the final area in the game. They save those three thieves, Sly eavesdrops on Miss Decibel and Surreal, and then they head to where his time-traveling blimp thing is docked to round out the area. You definitely do things in between, like set a bug in Miss Decibel's office to find out where the docking area is. But there's just, um, you know when you're playing a game and you're gripped and then by the end you feel this major drive to push forward and see what happens? Thieves in Time just didn't manage that for me. I was just sort of going through the motions by the end. I figured I had another hour or so to go before things picked up and got me to feel that drive. But nope, make Carmelita belly dance for some reason, even though I don't believe she'd ever do this. Hmm, shake it for Dookie, baby. Now draw her back at Interpol. Working hard and living her best life. Boom! Here's the blimp! This is almost over! Surprise! Don't get me wrong, Sly 4 is actually a long game. I just didn't realize how calm things would feel before the storm. The Penelope drama felt like a lead balloon though, so that probably didn't help matters. And I kind of hate how much I'm just speeding by things, especially the bosses themselves as characters, but eh, there's not much to say. Miss Decibel is a British elephant. Her backstory is Dimitris. She performed once and was hated, so she became a villain. She is ostensibly wooed by Surreal, falls for him, and does his bidding. All of the villains so far have had purposes aside from walking down the Coopers. Miss Decibel, for example, is writing false history records that make Surreal out to have royal descent. Grizz was planting art in the prehistoric age so that Surreal could air quote discover it in the present day and profit from it, etc. But these are just supplementary motivations to the plot. <laughs> anyway, as the gang strolls up up on the blimp, Surreal finally shows himself, having abducted Carmelita while she was left behind to distract the guards. Decibel fights Sly, hoping to dispatch him and join Cyril on the blimp, but he uh, lets her down easy, let's say, while stealing Salim's cane. It reminds me of how no matter what you do in Sonic Adventure, Eggman just gets away with the Chaos Emeralds at every turn. Returning to modern Paris, they find that Surreal has taken over the entire world and is just casually flying around in his blimp. 
I guess that's what you do in that situation. In the interest of time, Sly suggests that only he can board the blimp, since he can glide out with his paraglider to escape when it's done. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but we'll take it. He then sees Carmelita, recognizes that it's a trap, and then walks into the trap. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but we'll take it. Bentley and Murray gather the ancestors and stroll onto the blimp to recover their canes, warp them back to their times, and Tennessee saves Sly and Carmelita by shooting the proverbial jar they're encased in. Sly urges the rest to escape, which they can do somehow, despite Sly coming here on his own in the first place due to him being the only one to be able to escape, and we finally get some details on why Surreal was doing what he was doing. It's put together before you get here that Surreal's father was late to a robbery Sly's father had already committed, landing him in jail, and seating Surreal with a lot of pent-up resentment toward... Sly, who was not Sly's father. So he reveals that his plan was to completely erase the Cooper clan from history, trap each of them and steal their canes so they could never conduct their heists, all the while forging an entire ancestral line for himself leading to the modern day. This somehow also comes with the convenient byproduct of having his face plastered around the world and puts him in a leader positionship globally. It's just all a bit too much. I think I get what they were trying to go for here. The Cooper lineage is noble, only stealing from the worst of thieves to give back to those who are pure of heart, largely working in the shadows and never doing it for the fame. So the idea of introducing a jealous villain who works in the complete opposite way makes sense, but it just goes too far logically that he's also the leader of the known Earth due to discovering paintings trapped in ice and having a supposed royal family line. And I know it's a cartoony plot, but it just takes even more air out of an already sinking... Uh, blimp. It would have been an easier pill to swallow if his motivations were just to be the world's greatest thief. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't help that this is all resolved during an immensely underwhelming boss fight. Surreal is chased from point to point on his time machine thing, and then the fight plays out solely through quick time events. Incidentally, Thieves in Time has the least satisfying quick time events I've seen in a game in quite a while, providing no real audio or visual feedback that you're succeeding them as you do them. They just don't feel good to do and leave you wondering if you're succeeding. There's also a lot of dialogue here that isn't subtitled and doesn't match the actions or expressions of the characters well, which is an odd miss since the rest of the game actually really excels in that area. There's a lot of great per cutscene animations and it really makes them fun to watch. Here they just zoom right in on these characters speaking as their mouths don't move. So this gets to a point where the blimp is about to crash, Surreal whines about not wanting to die in an immensely obvious incoming betrayal, Sly helps him back up, and then Surreal jumps away with his paraglider and gets smacked in the face by a plane and sent to jail. Sly is presumed missing at the best for weeks and months as his friends are left trying to pick up the pieces and keep on keeping on as best as they can. All of this game's villains are sent to jail, aside from Penelope who gets away, then the credits end, and you see the title screen again. I'm a bit of a sucker for the main character disappears and the rest try to find their way trope, so I might be a bit biased, but I think this is handled well, even if everything leading up to it was routinely underwhelming. After 100%ing the game, you unlock a secret cutscene showing Sly finding himself in ancient Egypt, alluding to a world with, um... <clears throat> Slight in common? That was cut from the game due to the tech restraints of the PlayStation Vita version. This was intended to be finished out as free DLC for the game, but after PlayStation saw the sales for Thieves in Time, they pulled the plug. So to this day, this is where Sly is stuck. There was also the Sly movie that turned into the Sly animated series that supposedly debuted in October 29 despite not doing so, so it's safe to say that the series is doing pretty well these days. Whew! Okay, that's the plot. That's the broad strokes of everything. Honestly, it's a lot of nothing, a few plot elements that could have been done well, and by the precedent set before in this series should have been done well, I do have to admit, it was just fun to see these characters again, even if sometimes they're oddly out of character, but the biggest miss for me about this narrative is that it just doesn't carry momentum well. Meeting Sly's ancestors feels routine despite how talked up they are in the series. When drama does pop up, it feels weirdly out of place and resolved quickly, and Surreal as an antagonist is performed well, but as Sly himself points out, relied entirely on others' work to achieve what he did. He didn't steal the canes himself, and he didn't build the time machine. He just sort of strolls in and takes the credit. This should feel like a sick burn to Surreal when it's stated outright in the game, but it mostly just shines a light on the lack of presence he's had throughout the runtime. Sly 1 sort of had a similar structure with Clockwork, but it was pretty easy to forgive by comparison since, well, it was the first game. 
the series hadn't soared to its heights yet. What we're left with here is a MacGuffin chasing plot, where the MacGuffins are constantly stolen from you, B-plots resolve with little immediate or long-term consequence, and then the villain gets unceremoniously stamped out in a disappointing conclusion. It's one of those journeys where it feels okay as you go through it, but really doesn't hold up with any thought put in afterward. The other Sly games may suffer from that problem, admittedly, I, I don't quite remember, but they just had this X factor to them that made the journey really engaging throughout, especially the first two games. Fortunately, there's a video game included with this video game. Thieves in Time plays a lot like Sly 2 and 3, which is a very good thing. I'm sure when played side by side, it feels a bit different, but it does a great job at playing how I remembered those games feeling, so that's good enough for me. Sly returns with most of his major abilities either already available or purchasable later in the game as unlocks. Running, double jumping, cane swiping, pickpocketing, paragliding, walking across tight ropes, sneaking along edges, you name it, it's probably here. I still just love the feeling of controlling Sly especially with some generous abuse of how he clings to sneaking points, there's often potential to flow through environments and it always satisfies me. Now that said, sometimes Sly just chooses not to grab onto something and it's a bit more frequent than I'd like, or he'll just grab onto a different point than the one you intended even if it's much further away, but these quirks are infrequent and the checkpointing is usually generous enough for this not to be much of an issue. I really don't have any immediate complaints with Sly's core moveset. Costumes from Sly 3 return, but thankfully they're better here. Instead of doing Simon Says with guards, each time period you visit grants Sly a costume themed to that world that can be used in any other era once you've got them. There's a samurai outfit that lets you reflect fireballs and walk slowly, a jailbird outfit that lets you throw a ball and roll around on it when not walking slowly, a dead animal that lets you pounce on things and walk slowly, an archer outfit that lets you shoot arrows tied to ropes to walk on and walk at normal speeds, and finally a thief outfit that lets you strike things with a sword, slow down time, and walk at normal speeds. The first three costumes actively take away from Sly's moveset while introducing one or two abilities in its stead. You can't climb up poles, sneak along ropes, pickpocket, or run while wearing them. You can generally swap in and out of costume pretty quickly, thankfully, but with the last two costumes letting you keep most of your normal moves, it's difficult to not wish that they all fell into that same mold. There's not much to really say about these, they all do what I said they did, and they do those things when you need them to do. There's generally no point to wearing most of them otherwise, however. The archer outfit can only shoot arrows near specific arrow barrels, but the thief outfit lets you slow down time anywhere you want, so it's at least really useful for, say, getting away from guards since combat has never been ideal in this series as Sly. Combat is more ideal with Murray instead, who returns pretty much as he was before with punches and drop slams that create shockwaves. Bentley also returns as playable, trading his triple jump from Sly 3 with a hover instead, and gaining a few new tricks like being able to kick bombs toward things, making them stick, and then blowing them up. It feels great every time. Once in a blue moon, Carmelita is also playable. She can't do much other than shoot her shock pistol, but it feels good to do. Each character loses a few tricks that are either gone for good or bought back as upgrades throughout the game, and each of these three can purchase passive adjustments to their moveset, like confusion bombs for Bentley and flaming fists for Murray. You can get through the entire game without ever using these, as I did, but it's nice to have some options to tinker with to mix things up a little bit. I still enjoy playing as these guys, but they're used rather sparingly in the game and are generally always deployed to do the same things. Benley gets a lot more use than the other two in a way, but it's mostly through his hacking minigames. The top-down shooter from Sly 2 and 3 makes a welcome return here, utilizing a few different ship forms to let you do different things like shoot bombs, use ricochet shots, and circle enemies with a laser, that sort of thing. The next is a shoot 'em up styled side-scrolling game where you gather ionic bits that can upgrade this Rambo Bentley character. Taking a hit makes him lose a level, and gathering 5 bits levels him back up to shoot more shots, fire missiles, and just all around destroy what's in his path. I remember liking these a lot more in Bentley's hack pack, but after a decade of use my PS3 controllers analog sticks are starting to fail me so I had a lot of abnormal trouble playing these this time around. Uh, speaking of, the third hacking game here requires you to roll a ball through these mazes, trying not to fall through holes or get bumped off the edge by pinball-esque bumpers. These require the motion sensor in the controller to use, uh, sort of like how games on the Wii were played, and there's no option to turn it off. These just 
aren't that enjoyable, and I never looked forward to them when they popped up, but uh, thankfully there aren't many of them to deal with. Whew, there's so many different gameplay varieties in this game, this isn't even getting into things like Bentley's RC car and chopper. There's turret minigames, sarsaparilla chugging, shooting galleries. If there's anything you can say about Thieves in Time, it's that it isn't shy about keeping things varied. And to its credit, I can't think of one that was outright bad. These don't tend to overstay their welcome, and while it's easy to think that this could be a third 3D platformer in a series case where it kind of loses itself in alternate playstyles, no. Surprisingly, you still spend a ton of time playing with a sly-like gameplay style, so these actually serve their purpose to help mix things up without taking away from the main reason you're here. I say sly-like because all five of Sly's ancestors are also playable, and at their core they almost all have all of Sly's basic abilities. Just about everyone can sneak around, pickpocket, grab onto hooks, and propel themselves upwards, everything you'd expect. The odd one out is Bob, who can't walk across tight ropes and the like due to uh, not knowing sneaking yet, I guess, but there aren't many opportunities for him to try anyway, so it's not much of an issue. Unfortunately, in that spirit, not every Cooper is created equally. Ryoichi has a nice long distance sneak point jump, and Tennessee utilizes a lot of cool rail grinding and gets to basically rip off Red Dead Redemption with his gun. He's probably the most fun ancestral Cooper to play as. Bob's claim to fame is, as mentioned, climbing ice walls, and he sure can do that. The last two Coopers disappoint more than that. Sir Gallat's unique thing is his ability to charge up on hook rings and shoot higher up. In England, where this happens, Sly's similar ability is heavily nerfed even though earlier in the game he does the same maneuver to travel just as high if not higher. Does Britain just have higher gravity or something? Lastly, Salim has a carpet ride similar to Sly's paraglider and can dash up ropes and chains very quickly to get out of the way of rising snakes. But Sly gets the thief outfit with the time slow ability in the same world that effectively does the same thing in those instances. It's cool playing as the ancestors, again, they largely play exactly like Sly, so it's mostly a lateral move in terms of playstyle time, but I wish every Cooper brought as much to the table as Tennessee did. The Wild West world shines a lot due to just how fun his missions are. Speaking of the missions, most of them take place in specifically designed linear sections removed from the hub worlds. This means that a lot of the jobs you pull off in the game take place in areas made specifically just for them. Occasionally they'll require you to do some sneaking around in the main hubs, but for the most part, this calls back to Sly 1 in a way I really like. Each area being designed just for the job really let the designers aim for specific focused things. Like, there's this whole neat part of Arabia where you swap back and forth between Sly and Murray to escape from this big cave full of treasure with unique gimmicks and assets. It's a bit staggering to think of just how many there are, really. It's about this time where I have to respect a lot of the work that must have gone into building this game out. Five big hub areas, each of which having its own offshoot areas to work through, all filled with voice acting, hand animated cutscenes, there's just a lot here. And all of it feels lovingly crafted. If there's any downside, it leaves those hub worlds feeling underutilized. That Wild West world, for example, has a lot of neat sections that just aren't ever really explored until you go hunting for collectibles, and even then those are just quick in and out occurrences that take a couple minutes at best. Clue bottles, treasures, and per world pickpocketable items all return from Sly 2, and those bottles and treasures can be especially well hidden sometimes, but it sort of runs into the same issue Sly 3 had, where there's just not as much reason to run around in them. Like, I love that the game lets you run around in them as any of the playable characters found in that world. It's seriously neat that they let you, but I have no reason to ever be Murray in this world aside from the odd job or two he has here. I really can't complain that I can, but I just wish I had a good reason to. I don't ever feel like I had a Murray or Bentley specific collectible to get. I think it may have been annoying to have to go back to the hideout and swap characters after running into the kinds of situations that could have created, especially with this game's super long loading times, but there must have been something they could have done here to give these characters a little more to do. As for those worlds, for the most part, I think they're pretty good. They're mostly all just about the right size, and Thieves in Time's addition of a map and radar does a lot here to make up for the rare times when the lack of a landmark can make you wonder where you are. My favorites are probably the Japan and Arabia levels. Both of them feel perfectly sized with just enough tucked away bits and unique parts of the level to keep them interesting to explore. The Western and England worlds are a good equal second place. I feel both of them are missing a special something to put them above and beyond, but both 
have just enough going on to keep them fun. But it's the prehistoric world I don't like. It's very vertical and layered, which on paper should be a pretty good thing, but I just never had fun here. It's hard to put my finger on, but I always felt like I was out in the open with not enough ways to hide or flee the scene if I needed it. I, I don't know, it's difficult to really pinpoint any specific things here. Sometimes you just don't like something, and for me, this world and its missions didn't quite fit in this game. Also, I would just like to have a talk with whoever made a trailing mission go through a route with multiple clue bottles that alert the person you're trailing when you break them. Can we just chat? for a bit. So yeah, like I mentioned a couple times, clue bottles are back, 30 per world, most of them pretty fun to find, and a few per world are head scratchers. Getting all of them in a world lets you crack a safe and get what are honestly pretty passive abilities, a very handy magnet that brings in coins that are further away, taking half damage, a clue bottle locator, stuff like that. That said, I wish it told you what these things did when you get them. I kept having to run back to the hideout and see what they did, but that did let me go back and look at all the treasures I was bringing in. Just like Sly 2, you find these in the hub worlds, but Sanzaru pulled an interesting move here by slapping a timer on each one. Sometimes you've really got to optimize your plan to get back to the hideout on time. Oh, and if you take any damage, the treasure goes back to where you found it, so you have to be careful on top of that. Some of the highest stress moments I had playing Thieves in Time were running these back to procure them, I really like the way these were handled. Bringing in these treasures, alongside selling the items you pickpocket from guards, helps bring in a lot of coins for you to spend on new moves back in the hideout. These are often either priced just perfectly with how a typical playthrough would progress, or have items just unattainable enough but never outrageously more expensive than the amount you have at any given time. It's weird to say that a Sly Cooper game has a well-balanced economy, but Hey, it's true here. There are also 60 masks, which are new to this game, and are hidden throughout the hub worlds and even in mission-specific areas. Each few unlock different cosmetic options for the main crew, but the two most notable things are cane swaps for Sly. One gives you Cole McGrath's electric weapon from Infamous and imbues some lightning properties to attacks. The Infamous series had a ton of throwbacks to Sly, so seeing the love return here is great. The other really cool one is getting Ratchet's Wrench from the Ratchet and Clank series. It turns all of the coins you collect into bolts from that series and doubles the value of them. Now if only it came with a golden bolt. So really, all of this is to say that Sly 4 cherry picks a lot of things from its prior entries. It doesn't do everything it does perfectly. Often by lifting game design and concepts from earlier games, it does so with all of their pros and cons, but it at least makes for a game that's a lot of fun to play. I never really felt bored by the game itself. I know I mentioned that I wished I had more drive to see the ending earlier as I was barreling toward the end, but that doesn't mean I wasn't enjoying what I was doing quite a lot. I just didn't have the investment into the story I wish I did. But between all of its cutscenes, Thieves in Time knows how to offer for a good time. The few times I didn't have as much fun as I wanted were mostly just during boss fights with tricky sections that I just kind of brute forced through anyway, or slower parts that required specific costumes to be worn for a longer stretch of time. Really, the game has so many things to do that I'm sure I forgot something important that someone in the comments will yell at me about. It has such a clear reverence for the original trilogy too, so much so that it almost risks losing its own identity at times. There were so many instances going through the game that I was remembering things from the the original games, not to mention the tons of easter eggs there are. One of the coolest small touches in this game is that you can see clockwork hiding in each of the game's maps, living up to the original game's claim that he stalked the Coopers throughout history and eliminated each one. That is the kind of thing that no one would have asked for if it wasn't here, but Senzaru clearly adored this series and made sure to include it. Hell, I thought Sly having a really bad Italian accent in this game was just a weird joke, but when getting footage for Sly 3, I remembered that it was actually a throwaway line there that Sly uses a bad Italian accent when they're in Venice. Elements like these aren't included by those who don't care about what they're doing. I can't say I'll remember much of Thieves and Times' plot all too fondly, but I will remember how much love for the series it has. How much heart is imbued into the raw fundamentals of its design and presentation. Even if everything didn't quite work out how I'm sure they planned it, the fun had while working on this game shines through to the end product, and that's what I love to see if nothing else. 
I also gotta give some love to this game's soundtrack. It's largely handled by the composer of the prior two games, and it's fantastic throughout. Much like the game's settings and gameplay, it's always switching between styles. Sometimes it feels a little out of place to have this big band jazz playing while you're in RC car, but hey, what other game can say that? I think the game looks really nice too. It's too dark a lot of the time, like I had to turn up the in-game brightness just to see where I was going sometimes dark, but even 8 years later still looks wonderful to my eye. I actually like the new character designs too, even if sometimes the designs don't lend well to conveying facial expressions. Uh, the only downside of the presentation is the game performance. Most of the time it hits near 60 frames per second and feels really good, but from the prehistoric level onward I started getting a lot of frame dips. I haven't seen many others have the issue as badly as I've had it, so this may just be my PS3, but it started to actively hamper my inputs in tricky combat scenarios, which is never fun. I've also got to be the guy that stands up for something here. I think the drawn cutscenes in this game are great. I know they're stylistically different to the first three games, but I don't know, I've just always thought these looked pretty neat. A bit too goofy sometimes, sure, but very easy on the eyes. So man, that's Thieves in Time. I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot, but this video has to end at some point. To circle back to the question from the start, is this game as bad as I feared? Well, I think I can see why some feel the way they do. In terms of story, while I don't think it's often outright offensive, I can understand why people find the dip in writing quality here to sour the other entries and as a result separate it from them in their minds. But I don't know, more often than not, I was just enjoying how much the actors seemed to love what they were doing. It doesn't handle the drama it brings nearly as well as other entries, and I think maybe it could have cut back on some of its constant jokes, but I was really braced for much worse than I got here. Sure, Surreal is a pretty awful villain, and the journey wasn't too stellar, but I'd struggle to find myself with those who want this entry to outright not exist. Not to mention, this game is just so fun along the way and constantly exudes charm. I'm not sure where I'd put this game in the series personally. I might like it more than three, I might not, and that might make it my least favorite, but I still think it manages to be a pretty worthy sly entry all in all. Now if it did have a better story, we'd be having a much different conversation here, but I really think a lot of the hate this game gets is just focused on its narrative and ignores a lot of the good it brings otherwise. Sometimes you wait a long time for something, and then it finally comes out, and while the writing may not be as good as you hoped, hopefully you had fun along the way, right? Right? Anyway, as always, I've been Mykonis Fan, and this has been Learning to Love PlayStation. Thank you very much for watching. Whew, I'm glad I got that one done. No more memes about me never doing Sly 4! <laughs> I've done it! Learning to Love PlayStation is dead! Everything I outright ever promised for it is done! Huh? Okay, where's the damn Phantom Pain review? It's been centuries. Come on. We've been waiting for it. You only ever have disappointed me in your entire life. Have you learned to love PlayStation enough yet? Have you learned to caress PlayStation, to take it out on fancy, beautiful, romantic Italian dinners, to lay it down on your bed and cuddle it at night after making sweet, passionate, solid-state drive love to your PlayStation? Also, you want to play Apex later? Fans and pain review? What is he talking about? only made me hunger for more. At the time of this recording, the Phantom Pain is just days away. After three years of teases, bait and switches, fantastic trailers, and corporate drama, replaying Ground Zeroes again made me all the more impatient for what will most likely be the last entry in the Metal Gear Solid series, at least as far as fans are concerned. I'll be discussing the Phantom Pain soon enough.